Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of the CMAS podcast, Christian Masculinity Podcast. We've got Nicholas Stomphauser. Nick, how are you today? Excited to be in Hattiesburg here with Tim. Yeah, big recent move. You guys have got a good project in the works. I'm so excited to see more of that. I'm sure you'll share more when you can. We've got Mike Pantile as well. Mike, how's it going? Doing very well. Happy to hear with you fellas on, uh, on another Friday. Excellent. We're very, very lucky to have you here. If you guys haven't caught an episode with Mike recently, he's our new addition, the Italian Stallion. And that means he's our second Italian, actually, or part Italian. We've got Tim, too. Mr. Patriarchy himself. Tim, how's it going? I'm so well. How are you, boys? There's this new guy here in Hattiesburg. It's really taxing. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot who it is. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that guy on the stream next. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was funny because when when Nick said, sorry, real quick, when Nick said, I, I'm here with Tim, everyone's like, it looks like you're not, bro. Looks like you're yeah. in the I, I am, <laughs> yes. Are you close to him? Uh, yeah. So close. Yeah. <laughs> Emotionally very close. <laughs> yeah. he's, like, he's like 18, 19 minutes away by drive. I helped him set up his television set yesterday it's the nicest one on the planet earth this sounds That's good fantastic. so Very nice. yeah you guys it's going to be a, a powerful pairing with your project I, I can't wait to see it so we're talking about the sixth commandment today which is really topical given some of the debates about patriarchy versus degeneracy aka patriarchy versus red pill that have been raging on x in the last couple of weeks and before we get into it i just want to throw an interesting insight from the Frankfurt School. And it was Wilhelm Reich who wrote The Sexual Revolution. And he said that the sexual process has always been the core of the cultural process. The sexual process has always been the core of the cultural process. So these people really understand the importance of sex for society. They understand how to weaponize lust. And they knew that as radicals who want to restructure things, you go right to the root of society, which is the family. And what affects the family more than sex does? Because it's the means by which new life comes into existence. So give me your thoughts on that so far. Isn't it a great insight from our enemies that sex is the thing they want to take control of? What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it's... That's why it's so um, prevalent in our culture now, because it's such a, a mechanism of control, especially for young people and especially the way that it's marketed toward, well, I mean, not just young men anymore, it's young women too, is really capitalizing on that carnal appetite that they haven't really learned how to harness. And you take that and you combine it with a, um, a society that's abandoned God and you have a recipe for destruction, but not just uh, destruction, control. Because if you can control a man or a woman's sexual appetite and you can make it a ravenous, uh, unquenchable thirst, then you can very well control them in any which way you please. And so you kind of see that in sort of like the degradation of, uh, uh, you know, the roles of man and woman and now how it's kind of become inverted where, you know, this trans ideology is so um, pervasive and the same thing with this whole non-binary thing. People are just confused. Why? Because it comes down to sex and a lack of control and temperance around sexual appetite. So I'm excited for how this episode episode is going to play out, um, the adultery piece. And 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 um, I think in so many ways, we've been programmed to think that being a, a degenerate when it comes to our sexual appetites, even with just our eyes, is, 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 is quite telling. Because I used to think this was totally fine. You know, you can look at what's on the menu, but you just can't touch or eat it. No, no, no. It's much deeper than that, and there are spirit, spiritual costs to that mm. as well. Yeah, I love how like, you emphasize, Mike, there that uh, free love is actually a way of controlling and enslaving people. Tim, I, I wonder whether you could uh, pick up on Mike's point there that you can control men through lust. Yeah, you know, e EMJ, E. Michael Jones, was crafting uh, the exact same point 20 years ago in his own way. And I, I, I think I basically make the same point while I, when I say it needs to be overcome 
toward the end of political liberty. And that's its foil being called weaponized chastity in the case for patriarchy. But Mike, Mike intoned it really well there. And yeah, so it ends up being something that others have noted before. And when, when one comes to it, one really sees it clearly that the, the primary means by which a populace seems to be enslaved is through their own degeneracy. And it's primarily through the eyes and the flesh. I'd also make the point in addition, because Mike intoned it so well with the, the sex specific stuff, I would just say defining a problematic um, from the, from the first act, if we think of the angels, ab initio, or, you know, angels and fallen, fallen angels, demons are defined by the choice that they made at the beginning of time. Defining a species, specifically rational animals, by that act which brings about their own conception is, makes so much sense. It's perfectly natural. And when you, you say something like this, oh, human beings, we, we know the most about them by this central act of sexuality, which is the act from which everything else precedes ab initio. During the 90s and early 2000s, you had left liberals and, and left libertarians, not so much right libertarians, gaslighting us into thinking that we were exaggerating upon the incredible a generative power, as if it were arcane generative power of sexuality. Remember Richard Dawkins saying, uh, you know, God doesn't care about something so petty, what we do with our private parts. <laughs> it's amazing to me how much purges that had at the time. People thought that was a really great point. It was never a great point. It's, it's obviously a really, really race-defining thing, human race-defining thing, and it's an individual-defining thing, considering that, as Sister Lucy said at Fatima, most people, as was told to her by the Virgin Mary, go to hell because of sins of the flesh. So it's, it absolutely makes sense, and everything proceeds according to um, those designs by which you and you and Mike already described it so well. Yeah, so important to bear that in mind that is the way in which most people who end up in hell get there. Lust is the the widest gate, as Saint Alphonsus put it. I've just collected a few other quotes along that line of thought so you can see how many people have ended up with the same conclusion. St. Bernardine of Siena, this sin draws the whole world, as it were, into sin. And then the Colombian philosopher Don Colacho said that sexual promiscuity is the tip society pays in order to appease its slaves. G.K. Chesterton argued the same point. Free love is the direct enemy of freedom. It is the most obvious of all the bribes that can be offered by slavery. So these guys, in many cases, centuries before EMJ, were making the exact same point. That this is the way that you can effectively cuck men or enslave them to lust. But what we have already talked about so far is how it actually makes culture basically downstream from whatever degenerate women happen to want because that's what these guys are chasing so it's actually a form of feminism in that it frames things so that the woman basically determines how society goes and Herbert Marcuse recognized this too these Frankfurt school boys are seriously smart and he said look feminism is potentially the most powerful and the most radical movement that we have if you get control of the sexual practices of all the hot young girls, then who's going to come along for the ride? All the guys. They lose frame, and then that's how you destroy patriarchy, promoting promiscuity. It's genius, isn't it, Nick? Tim's weaponized chastity section, I think I even like photographed it and sent it to him when I read it the first time, uh, was, was pretty earth-shattering for me as a young guy because... Marriage was always presented as sexless and where romance goes to die. And when you understand Eros to be a positive feedback loop 
an upward spiral of the human spirit toward the true, the good, and the beautiful. Then the idea of contextualizing eros within marriage, um, it becomes a, an extremely powerful modality for sex as opposed to sublimating that prior to or outside of something so correct and targeted like marriage. Because <clears throat> I'm thinking, for example, pornography, which is used as a weapon of war, we are currently being attacked by it. Maybe, maybe not us for with hardcore pornography, but there's Super Bowl ads and simply the outfits that women wear around the Instagram posts, all this stuff. It's they've pushed the line of what's acceptable so far that you basically are living in a Sports Illustrated magazine nowadays. Um, and then as EMJ points out that the um, a certain country in the Middle East used pornography against a certain other country in the Middle East because they found that this deployment of it uh, sublimated the energy that the men had to fight the kinetic war. Um, to, to give a damn about the stuff that mattered because the the telos of the human spirit fight for the true, the good, and the beautiful. That upward spiral was completely sublimated. And that's what, well, I'll try to use clinical terms, um, the climax of the sexual experience does. You have this massive release of, of hormones that decrease stress rapidly. And this is oftentimes why people who are stressed, they reach for um, alcohol, they reach for a, a hard drug, or they reach for pornography, they reach for easy sex, because it's has a drug-like effect on the mind and on the body. You're releasing that stress and you you get to cheat. You get to cut ahead in line and think like, ah, I solved the problem. I've gotten to the to the good part of what it means to be a human being. So this concept that Tim put forward of weaponized chastity uh, steals the frame back from the hot TikTok girls and the, the OnlyFans girls. And once again, it places the burden fully on the shoulders of the patriarch of the man to say like if you want to reclaim culture you can't just yell at a certain group of people how come you've released pornography upon the world <laughs> you know or the tech giants in 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 silicon valley why do you allow porn on this platform or something like that well what are you what are you doing specifically to reclaim it because it's you can't finger point, you know, power follows where the finger points. If you're, if you're saying, well, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them that are responsible for my downfall, pointing at yourself, then you can actually start to reclaim control over that situation. Yeah. Really powerful point. There's that image in legend, isn't there, of the vampire that he can only get into your house if you let him in and sin is always crouching at the door. And it's a symptom of the fact that society is sick, that porn, etc., is so popular. Do you know what, though? This is a really old lesson. And it's funny that people normally need to be reminded of things more often than they need to learn new things. And this is one of my favorite stories from the Bible. I think it's so relevant to today. So this is the book of Numbers 25, 1 to 3 story of Moses and the Moabites. And Israel at that time abode in Setim, and the people committed fornication with the daughters of Moab, who called them to their sacrifices, and they ate of them and adored their gods. And Israel was initiated to Bil Figor. So what happens here is that Balak, the king of the Moabites, he's hired Balaam, a prophet for hire, to curse Israel. And then Balak says, uh, look, I've seen the progress and the might of Israel, and I really want to do something to stop them. Uh, Balaam takes the money and says, look, I'm sorry, I can't curse them because God won't allow me to do that. But he has a better plan instead. He says, I'm going to send thousands of women to the Israeli encampment. And if we can lure them into idol worship through lust, then God himself will curse them instead. I can't curse them, but I can get them tempted and then God will curse them. So they send these women into the Israeli camp. And then just as Balaam expected, the Israelite men start having regular sex with them. 
and then they get drawn into their religious sacrifices and they worship with them and they join them in the sacrificial meals. So they're all bowing down to the pagan idols now because they've lost frame because they were simping for these women who were sent there as a weapon of warfare, basically. So this is the mass loss of frame that results in even the, the leaders of the Israelites and the Midianites just being caught in broad daylight, having orgies. And then God just says to Moses, right, kill everyone involved. And it numbers about 24,000 people. And this is basically a microcosm of what's happened to the West. Because just like Wilhelm Reich said, you use sex to control society. And Western men, Christian men have lost frame in exactly this way because they haven't kept God's commandments. So it's not a new story, but it's so effective because it works on such a profound level. And the sixth commandment with Tim's weaponized chastity is effectively the only way to fight back. You guys heard that story from the Bible before? Yeah, and that's a great one. Great example to use. And to to quote my uh, my good friend, Jonathan West, um, pimping always leads to simping. Always. <laughs> it always does. And so I think that's uh, the weaponized chastity piece, what we're talking about, reminds me of uh, that that uh, clip of our boy Chase, Sovereign Broth, going viral, which sparked this whole red pill patriarchy debate to begin with. And he was saying, well, if men just decided to not do this anymore, if they decided to weaponize their chastity, women would follow suit and it caused this whole big stir up. But I, that's the only solution, would you say? They follow our lead. So expecting them and this gynocentric world order to change uh, um, and then, you know, and us not having an active role in it is is like you've cucked your own masculinity there. You're like you've abdicated your role as a man and leader of society. You care about not uh, society not having all these whores, but you're going out there and you're making the whores. So, Nick, Mike's point there is that expecting women to fix feminism basically is feminism. Hey, ladies, come and solve our problem for us. We can't do it by ourselves. Yeah, it's simple supply and demand economics. Like, you just bleed them dry, remove remove the demand, you know. And I actually think that that's possible um, through, it's going to be the corniest thing I've ever said in my entire life, through the power of love. <laughs> cue, cue, cue Huey Lewis in the news here <clears throat> um, but I genuinely think that that's the case because I think you could get you know the 70% of the bell curve maybe not the extremes but the middle 70% of the bell curve compelled by the power of love um, that Hey, I yeah, know that's good. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, hitch a ride on, on my skateboard on the back of a Jeep Wrangler. Uh, yeah, from a guy wearing a Mountain Dew hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over to your house later today. I'll be there in a second. <laughs> so, but I do think this is this is true. That think think about the middle 70% of that bell curve and like women who watch Hallmark movies during the holidays and and the women watching this completely ignore how corny and whatever the whole kitschy the whole film is and what do they go right to the love story they just they grab onto it and they're like I want that I just want that I just want that strong man that whatever it is that Hallmark puts forth and weirdly enough like those Hallmark movies they get it right a lot of times with the tropes because they have to, they have to appeal to the widest audience on that. So yeah, there might be like the token black trans Muslim one legged person who's like the cashier or the best friend or something like that. But ultimately, they tell the full story and the right story. So yeah, go for it. And imagine a world where you have presented a love story that's superior to, for, for a man, superior to um, going through boxes and boxes of tissues alone in his room. And for women, just taking the millionth selfie uh, of her body and posting it on Instagram. And you give them an alternative to that. And specifically, the men basically boycott 
the marketplace of women, then all you have left, like, who's Andrew Tate going to be talking to? Who's Justin Waller going to be talking to? Like, they're going to be screaming into the void. And you might have, like, 50 girls and 50 guys in some yacht in Dubai. But, like, that middle 70% is going to bleed the economy dry. And I really do think you could see a, a rapid cultural shift that way. Well, real yeah. quick, just to interject before you go here, Will, what's the most loving thing that you, what is what is one of the most loving things you can tell your wife? No. So now look at that as a, a societal thing. Men just saying no. And I like the power of love thing, but I, I, I look at it, I, maybe I'm a bit of a dick. It's just saying no. Like there's a power in a woman yeah. trying to seduce you and you're just like, and you just push her away. Like, I ain't doing this. Like it would, that would drive her insane. And you could, you would, you, what you would experience is women would buck up against this really hard at first and then they would just follow suit. What, it, what does it come down to? Will, you said it. It's frame. Guys lack frame. They let their peepees control their little head control their big head. That's yep. what it is. So, Tim, look, what, what we're saying here is feminism could end tomorrow on a really profound level if guys just waited until marriage for sex, right? Well, was, absolutely. I mean, it would probably take a generation to turn around. Plato says it takes four generations to turn around once you have cultural rot, and degeneracy, disintegration, this profound. But yeah, I, I think it would begin turning around right away. The clinical effects would be almost immediate. And I just wanted to add to Mike's point that saying no is an aphrodisiac. Saying no like lovingly, not in a, a LARPy way to your wife, not only does it make uh, non-virginal women want a virginal man, it's absolute aph aphrodisiac, uh, well-known well phenomenon. But from within the confines of a given loving marital relationship, when a man says, no, no, like if you're having a really good day with your wife and this goes for good men who have good wives that aren't manipulative on either side i've been told by my wife several times that like if you're having a good day and you're getting along with each other the way two best friends should and then she suggests something given your positive momentum sort of just assuming the answer will automatically be yes because that's the momentum of human relationships and you're like oh no still without without breaking stride we're having a great day but um no i, I don't want to go that way because of this that's incredibly attractive to a woman and most men mm. think it's hypothetical for most men. Most men, I think Will, um, Nick said this on a recent C-Mask episode. Most guys have never said no to a woman. I think you were talking about the red pill guys. It's hypothetical to them. It absolutely works. And I can personally attest to the fact that it's not mistaken as manipulative or anything, but it is usually received as something that represents the utmost manliness and is, uh, you know, you can, you can see the clinical effects of that. Yeah. And maybe one reason these guys can't hold down marriages is because they don't say no before and they can't say no after marriage either. And that's a bad thing. Sorry, Nick. No worry. Yeah. Tim, it sounds like what you're saying is that, um, there's, Unconsciously, what's happening is a shit test in the creation of dread, but not in the gross degenerate red pill way. Where absolutely right, you have the woman again unconsciously. She's not trying to be like, let's see if I can do this. But the day is going well, and she just proposes something, and and unconsciously, she definitely wants to know that the 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 momentum of the day has not whittled away at your at where you're going that you just haven't gone with the current of whatever is happening in the day but you still have a heading and so i don't think that's why she asks the question but by right. saying no it reveals that no i haven't deviated course everything is going according to plan and you can still follow me and then it again without you being a douchebag generates dread not in the role of tomasi way of oh shoot i better like stay on this ship because he's going whether i'm there or not and then once again that's like i'm following and that's attractive yeah fraser and niles would call that subconsciously uh, you know people people from that background they believe in something called the subconscious and whether or not it's it's true at the 
species genus level. It's it's at least true analogically. People people kind of do things sometimes with a secondary motive that they're not explicitly putting all of their their oomph or their will into. And absolutely, absolutely, uh, remember the uh, the mutual submissionists like Father Mike Schmitz. They always say. What, what is submission? That that means that a woman just wants to put herself under your mission, which is not how etymologies work. You know, the, the pre- that He the said pre- that? Seriously? That's what focus is telling everyone submission means. It means, it doesn't mean she has to do whatever you say. It means sub. We're going we're gonna to look at the, the Latin here, and we're going to say sub means under. And mission means mission where it's like wait wait a minute why are you why are you taking the cognate from the english but the prefix from the latin it, it's actually ridiculous but the point is here we'll, we'll take their definition for half a second it doesn't mean that submission has an altogether different essence or definition it still means what it means your wife has to do everything you say aside from grave sin but in this context a woman does want to be with what your plan for the day is or or with what your where you're going to borrow the term that was just used and it's really cool later even if you're not trying to be a douche and you're just like oh no we would no we can't do that but hey let's get back to having fun or whatever i mean you don't even have to give an apology just no we're not, we won't do that but look we'll keep having fun this way it's a really stark reminder because sometimes um, Steph has done this. We're late on show. Be like, yeah, I don't even know why I suggested that. Um, you know, I like she, she, most of her suggestions are really good, and you can go with them. You don't you don't have to say no for the sake of saying no. But sometimes on a really good day, we'll get one that will pop up consciously in her to her later, subsequently in her memory, and she'll be like, I don't even know why I suggested that, but it's really cool. I'm with a guy that says no. They realize this stuff. The ladies, men, and and saying no is one of the main marks. And yeah, it's it's a subconscious shit test. Perhaps think of it that way if you need to. Thank you very much, Red Bill. Yeah, you can think of feminism as just history's greatest shit test. Doctor Stephen yeah. Baskerville has described the sexual revolution as a honey trap, and guys just fell right into it. And some of them enjoy it. They enjoyed the sticky situation, and they like the taste of honey. But now we have to get out of it because culture is on a downward spiral. Everyone can see that now. Even the Red Pill guys are complaining about it. So, sixth That was an amazing interview, Will, by the way, that you did with Baskerville. He's a smart guy, isn't he? Brave guy, too. Lost his job for his research. And if you haven't heard that one, you can get it on my channel. He's uh, He's got many of the insights that we're exploring here. And his book, The New Politics of Sex, just lays it all out in terms of the... Uh, the way it's been rolled out in family court and divorce law as well. It's really important. So sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's not only about adultery because the commandments uh, imply more than they explicitly command. So the Baltimore Catechism says, what does the sixth commandment actually command us to do? Well, to be pure and modest in our behavior. And there's this interesting point that purity is necessary to safeguard the other virtues which i guess makes sense given what we've said so far about how impurity has been weaponized and i just wanted to bring in aquinas's point about the first effect of lust or the first daughter of lust being blindness of mind so impurity leads to blindness of mind when you're simping you end up blind in a way you, you flout the rules and then you kind of forget why they ever existed. And it is very hard for anyone to talk sense into you because you're enslaved in exactly the way that your enemies hoped you would be. Nick, does that make sense to you? Impurity helps to safeguard the other virtues. It sounds like if, if lust is blinding, then there was a clever bit of bait and switch when the phrase love is blind became in vogue that that's probably not the case infatuation and lust are probably blinding and love should be clarifying because if if love truly is the you know the orientation toward the true the good and the beautiful then 
it shouldn't be blinding or confusing or obfuscating. It should be clarifying to the soul. Um, and maybe that's why if, you know, Tim's talked before about like the moment you have substantial certitude that you want to marry the woman, just take action on this. Don't dither around for 12 months, two years, three years in an engagement. Um, cause love should be clarifying in that way. But yeah, I definitely just in my own experience, you can't, I don't think you can really like work on humility if you're watching pornography every day. I don't think you can really work on charity and all these other virtues. If, if every day you have just like this grievous mortal sin of, of lust, or even if let's say you've gotten rid of that, but like, you're just a creep, a creep staring at women out in the world all day. Like think, think of a married guy trying to like get fit in the gym and be a good father who's just ogling women in Walmart or something while his kids are in the car. You'd be like, what? you're not going to make it dude. Like they're put first <laughs> things first here. I love sure. that point, Nick. So l lust is blind, but love definitely isn't. And all the assaults on our eyes in contemporary culture that are so heavily encouraged in the media and fashion trends, that encouragement of immodesty is an assault on purity because it's just surrounding men with occasions of sin the whole time. Mike, so, you brought up eyes earlier. Can I uh, finish one yeah, thing go, Nick, yeah. before you jump in? Go ahead, Nick. Yep. Um, this is more for, I think, the younger guys because I, I know that the older you get, the less likely you are to just kind of be scrolling on social media. Um, but I was, I was scrolling many hours a day and whenever I was eating, taking a dump, just at a red light, whatever it was, it's scroll, 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 scroll. And what I was noticing is that in confession, I would still be confessing like the wandering of the eyes to what, just what's there. It's not the pursuit of it, but it's just all there. And for, for Lent, I just deleted Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube off my phone. I was just like, I'm going to get this off because I want less screen time and see, I want to see what happens when I'm bored. Can I be bored? And it turns out to be quite pleasant. It was really scary at first, but now it's quite pleasant to be bored. Um, and then I looked back and I went, wait a second. There's been no instances of the, you know, the wandering eye or the lustful eye because I just removed all of the substrate for the chemical reaction. And it might be necessary, guys. It might be time. I'm speaking to the to the younger generation who is on their phones as much as I am. Like, if you want to dial it up a notch, if you've gotten the pornography and the masturbation out of your life, if you've if you've really started to take your faith seriously, the next step might be like keep keep the scrolling to like zero as much as you possibly can because 99.9% .9 of the shit that's being put in front of you is worthless. Like I, I've been off Twitter tenfold since Lent started and I find myself not caring about like everything that I cared about the week prior. <laughs> it's yeah, not it's important. When I, it's the dopamine drain. It's the dopamine yeah, drain. Yeah. When you're in public, you're just looking for little hits of it, whether it's a woman with spandex on or whatever. That's what you're subconsciously seeking. And so to your point, Will, about um, purity, safeguarding the other virtues, it's because lust darkens your intellect. How can you possibly be even be like a spiritual or rational position, intellectual position to safeguard the other virtues if you've got one of the most grievous ones that's it's completely out of control, Right. Even purity in terms of like your temperance with drink, right? It's like you're getting drunk off of alcohol. Um, well, now your guards are completely down. Now you're in mortal sin territory. And now you're, you've kind of opened up the Pandora's box of sin. It's no different with lust. And so I noticed for me, eyes, that, that was the final frontier against lust for me. It had been such a big part of my life, pornography, masturbation. Okay, these things are long gone. And then I found myself as a married man, eyes were just all over the place. Like this final remnants of this beast, this sin that I possessed was still there. And it was so autopilot because I was just so used to it. And so to your point, Nick, 
most men don't possess the willpower and temperance necessary to just control their eyes. And there was a time where I felt like that was me, but combine that with discipline and fleeing from sin. Now it comes to the point where if I'm scrolling through something on Twitter or Instagram and there's something that catches my eye, I immediately like put the phone down and I walk away. I'm just like, I'm it's like Joseph and the prostitute. I'm like, I'm running away from it. Wasn't always like that though. I also had to change my environment. And this is where a lot of guys don't, maybe don't want to address it. For me, it was the gym. So instead I'm like, okay, well, I have a basement that's not being used. I don't want to be in an environment where my eyes even have the potential to, 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 to wander. I'm just going to fill my basement with, with equipment and I'm going to remove myself from the situation altogether. And I don't think that's, that's, go ahead, Nick. Dude, there's no shame in that. And I don't think you need to like Jocko Willink and David Goggins yourself through these situations. Like we pray in the, our father, lead us not into temptation. And we're told by the catechism, by the church to avoid the near occasions of sin, avoid them. Right, not put yourself. It's like in front a drunkard of it. not going to a bar. Like why yeah, would the drunkard don't go to a bar? Do it. Just don't yeah. do it. Stay away from booze. Right. So get get the apps off your phone. Find the things in your environment. Like Odysseus tied himself to the mast, not because he was a, a bad leader. It was because he would be the worst leader in the world if he gave himself the opportunity to dive into the to the to the water and swim to the sirens. Tie yeah, yourself. You to the mix. Yeah, you you know Orpheus um, faced the sirens too didn't need to be tied to the mast though because he just played his beautiful music instead. Now you can tie yourself to the mast or you can just fill your mind like Aquinas says with the good, the true, the beautiful and then focus on that instead. It doesn't have the same draw for you. Yeah, and that's what what I found was removing myself from the situation, having that distance from it for a long time. Now when I go back to it... Mm, mm. That foundation has been fortified. I'm already used to not looking at anything. There's nothing around me. So when that temptation is there, I'm so used to it not being there and not feeding that indulgence that the beast has died altogether. And yeah. so this is what I tell a lot of the guy, a lot of guys that I coach and friends of mine. It's like, listen, if you struggle with lustful thoughts, stop feeding them. Stop sitting there and actually entertaining those thoughts. Just occupy yourself with something else. And now I find I'm in a position where I've done that so often, where for me to have a lustful thought about anybody except for my wife. I'd have to actually sit there and try to conjure the thought up because it's so alien to my nature now. And I think that doesn't really get discussed a lot. Like the, the, the plasticity of your brain is incredibly powerful. And I've also experienced this too with pornography where I had crippling erectile dysfunction where now it's like I haven't done any of this stuff in so long where like a gust of wind comes by the, 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 the wrong way and I feel like a 13-year-old boy again. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you're not in a windy city there. <laughs> Good thing I stay home often. <laughs> Very inappropriate. Well, it's the windy nope, city. I'm, saying, oh, I'm calling in sick to work. Yeah. Nate and, and Mike are you're both making, um, I think, excellent points that because society is so steeped in ornea, which doesn't just mean it's four letters, it's inclusive it in other things, and 90 Eight percent of men admit to having looked at it in the past six months, like the hardest version of Ornea. That everyone's just got this like crippling heroin addiction. So we're not talking about any of the particulars or any of the nuances phenomena that are noted by guys like the four of us that are years after any kind of uh interaction with hardcore Pernea. And the interesting thing is what you both are noting, um, Mike, it's like, yeah, habit is the governing rule in human behavior. And after you ditch the hardcore heroin, you're going to have all kinds of bad little ticks and habits from it. One, one notices this one, once comes, once one comes off of the, even, even just the soft core, even once you get serious about like, I'm not going to look at that whatever chicks uh, breasts, and, and I'm, this is what I told Chase when before the red pill, like tucked and cucked from our debate, we we're going to do the four on four. I was like, look, man, I'll, I'll come. I told you this, Mike, too. I want to do this. I was the one pushing to have this thing, this four by four debate. But I the one thing I won't do, I'll drive anywhere in the country, but I will not join a, a, a cast 
that's festooned by whores on the side. I, I, I can't do that. They win if they get us to do that. Like virtuous men who are trying to be the paragon for young men. And, uh, you know, we, we, we can't do that because guys are used to that are used to hardcore pornea are also like, well, no big deal. Have a girl with half of her breast out in front of me. So that this is the, the other thing about like, if I see a fat guy, whether he's a podcaster or an influencer, if one can't even touch and taste are the two measures of temperance and your ability to resist them. If I see a fat guy, I know with 99% substantial certitude, that guy's addicted to porn. Like a, a fat guy that can't even say no to his less powerful taste drive is not going to be able to say no to his less powerful touch drive. There's always exceptions, but it makes bad law. So I like the points you guys are making about society so steeped in the raging heroin problem right now that for folks like us who are like, I don't even look at a chicken spandex when she walks by, aside from maybe, you know, maybe the first flinch but before the will kicks in, it's like, nope, got to Got to look over here. Got to walk over here. Once you've been years, decade plus on that path, what the raging heroin addicts are doing in the other 98% of society, it, you look over there and you remember about it and it's shocking. They're not even tending. They don't, they can't even fathom what ends up being the, the daily habitual routine for avoidance of this stuff yep. for a guy like you or you or you. It turns into fuel for me um, for things that I'm working on personally would to be revealed later but when i contrast in the way that tim just did with where i was and where i am now i get angry when i'm forced into a, an environment or a situation um where you know i had to unfollow some people or, or mute some people on twitter a lot of uh conservative women quote unquote um they don't they don't understand that when they're quote tweeting and retweeting these videos of heinous things, uh, or even just these wars from the whatever podcast, that you are now disseminating and multiplying this content for your tens of thousands or sometimes millions of male followers. So I had to mute them, get them out of here. And then I saw... Kanye walking with his wife Bianca and she's in a rain poncho a plastic rain poncho and nothing else and I got so angry I was like screw Kanye West this is screw this guy this guy has just put this into the world he is now my enemy now I know Kanye has a sorted past with all kinds of craziness maybe Maybe he's a good guy and he's just going through it. I don't really care. He's never going to know who I am. That's not my point. My point is, is like people who now put this into the world in, in the content itself, that's my enemy. And once you get on this side of it and you stop having tolerance for just the little paper cuts or the big knife stabs, um, then, then it's like, it's all out war. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this out of at least my life. You, you, you get so angry like how dare you like crap on my living room floor why would you do that like you just walked into my I life told you sorry about that yesterday <laughs> <laughs> it's I have no longer with that damn right TV. there <laughs> we so. had to go it's mo but it's more understandable for Kanye uh, I mean less understandable for Kanye because he's a man for the the conservative women through a retweet or something I'll just I'll just say this in their defense Women sincerely don't understand no, what an autonomic response they're producing, particularly like a conservative woman that, because I, I talked about this, and you brought it up. I talked about it with many women. They don't understand the profundity of the autonomic ref reflex. They're like, I know men are more wired to their eyes, but like I was making fun of this girl's slutty tweet and, you're like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Give it no air. Give it no air. Like, do not air out your dirty laundry at all. There are so many ways that this can be devil. A guy who's, who's even good at avoiding such 
health. Actually, a real quick plug for Aquinas. He has something fascinating called the five ways of gluttony. And they are um, eating too soon, too expensively, too much, which is the obvious one, the third one, too eagerly and even too fastidiously. That means eating too picky, pickily can be gluttonous. This is how men are. It's highly analogous with their appetite for sex. Can be too fastidious. Even you get too much into what what flavor, a blonde or a redhead. You, you know, locker room talk. It's a kind of fastidiousness that is a kind of lust. A direct mm. analogy. Too eagerly and too much are kind of the obvious ways one can be gluttonous with sex. But um, too expensively. This means when it's almost like Fraser Crane out of desperation is taking women on these Ill- elaborate dates. And making elaborate plans, it, it, it becomes pornographic. And of course, too soon. So uh, th- my point is just that women sincerely don't understand the degree to which men are wired to their eyes and therefore the dangers that they're trying to point out by pointing them out explicitly often you're presenting them. So I, I would just say well, Kanye is much more accountable via she and tear than the women, but we're, we're off on a screed now. This is why Christ set such a high standard by saying that if a man so much as looks at another woman with lust in his heart, then that's adultery. Because you can hear on supposedly conservative outlets like Prager U that it's okay to look at people however you want and maybe even think and fantasize about them however you want. And no big deal. So, Nick, I think you're right to take it so seriously. And it's almost like step one of humility which is having that humble distrust of yourself. Like, I probably wouldn't be okay if you put me in that situation for long enough. And every man who's honest with himself has to recognize that weakness in fallen human nature and that there's no way you're going to reach this very high standard set for us by Christ without his help. You have to just throw human weakness and all its frailty onto him and let him help you work at it because otherwise you've got no hope. It's going yeah, to be I'm not Will. Orpheus. Go ahead with Nick. Sorry. I'm not Orpheus. Like, that, I might be at age 50 starting now. In 25 years, I might have enough beautiful music in my head to be Orpheus and not, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. care about the sirens. But I, today, I'm Odysseus. Yep. And I'm going to tie myself to that mast. I'm going to clean up my environment. Yep. So that one day I can be Orpheus. Exactly. And these habits are no joke to eradicate if you cultivate them and let them entrench themselves in you. Sometimes it can be years of work to get rid of them. Mike, you had a point. Yeah, no, I I, I was to just started to think about, I, I find it really funny that there's all these guys, you know, God is so absent in our, our culture and guys end up steering toward like stoicism, Marcus Aurelius and all these other guys. And I'm willing to wager that if these guys existed today, they would be porn addicts. <laughs> yeah and, and so my, my point yeah. is we need god right it's not stoicism this like pseudo philosophy this mindset it's like no 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 it's got to be way more than a mindset because our will and our muscle can only hold on for so long until that carnal drive our fallen human nature kicks in and the only thing in so many instances when i want to look at a woman or look at something and glance at, at my phone not pornography that's long gone but even just i don't know a woman working out um, on my phone or whatever, because it, you know, stumbles, you stumble upon it in your, the algorithm. It's the fear of God that makes me flee. That fundamentally, I'm like my resolve, I'm feeling all that, those, those pee pee tingles that we all feel as men. The only thing that makes me put that phone down and walk away is the fear of God. It's that perfect container and, and that having that law, those rules of how we must abide. That's it. It's the ultimate standard. Without that standard, how can we resist? We can't. Yeah. Well, the, 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 um, the trend catechism says that we can't promise to ourselves that we're going to stay out of even venial sin forever. So you're just saying the same thing, Mike, which is that you've got to be careful with what you surround yourself with. And the Baltimore catechism puts it like this. So chief dangers to the virtue of chastity. We pretty much covered them all. They mention idleness, sinful curiosity, bad companions, drinking, immodest dress, indecent books, plays, or movies. So it's basically what Nick is saying about avoiding the near occasions of sin. You've got to be careful what you put into your mind because that changes what you think about and eventually changes your actions too. So they're saying 
how do we preserve it then? What are the chief means of preserving the virtue of chastity? It doesn't say go read some self-help books from a stoic bro. That's not going to work. It says, first up, avoid all those unnecessary dangers. Seek God's help through prayer. Frequent confession. I don't know about you guys, but I go monthly and then some people might even benefit from going weekly. If you're having a really tough time with something you're trying to break, weekly might be the best option for you. Take communion. And then they also mention assisting at mass and super powerful one, special devotion to the Blessed Virgin as well. Mm. Uh, I, I would recommend. Add... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, I would recommend to men out there who want to receive the Eucharist weekly that you, you go weekly, uh, which is why I mean, traditionally in, for Roman Catholics, you, you go at the beginning of Mass and confession was held all through with what's now called the, the liturgy of the word. They made up this new half of the Mass. That's when you go to confession. Just to be sure, uh, I don't receive eucharist weekly so i don't go weekly but I, I never receive the eucharist anymore without going ahead of time i was just gonna give that bit of advice go ahead Nick. yeah it's, it's a great practice um something that i've only recently discovered uh that i would assume applies to more people than just me and unfortunately i don't have perfect words for it yet but hopefully i can evolve this over the next few months of thinking about it but the to truly dissolve a temptation, and I'm just speaking about lust right now, but it applies to all temptations, there's an ego death that occurs. The reason being that I've found is that you have to admit to yourself in the moment of temptation that you actually do want to sin. Not, I'm being attacked by this temptation. God, please stop this attacker. Please stop. Why aren't you stopping? Oh, no, I sinned. I was attacked by a temptation and I just wasn't strong enough. God, give me strength next time. God, why aren't you helping me? You wanted to. And before you need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit or God, you had basically every every capacity in your own will to not sin and you chose not to and you shirked that responsibility and there's a moment when you take responsibility and you choose not to sin that you feel two things first is the ego death of i don't get to do my favorite thing i don't get to sin and no one's here to congratulate me for doing this good thing that's the ego death no one's going to give you a round of applause for letting go because it happened inside. And the second thing is immediately after that, that's when Christ takes away the temptation. Not before, because you don't learn anything before. You don't develop any virtue beforehand. It's immediately after you've, you've actually released your soul. Okay, 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 I don't want to lust. I'll let it go. I'll sit alone in the dark, silent, and feel this loneliness even though I'd feel so comforted if I lost it, if I watched porn, if I did all these things. It's in, in the immediate subsequent moment, that's when Christ takes away the temptation. That's beautifully said. That That's very well said. And and this is the, my point with these guys that walk around saying, I'm addicted to porn. I might be minimizing it. I don't know. I was pretty entrenched in a degenerate lifestyle, and then eventually it just took me saying no. A lot of these guys just don't want to quit. Right. A lot of these men want their sin. They want it, and they'll rationalize it away by saying, I'm addicted. No, you just haven't said no hard enough. Right. That's what you've chosen. Well, guys will also, scream at you for that, but that's the truth. They get mad. Hey, they very, very touchy about that. Take away an addiction. They're like, no, no, I have to do that. It's like, you don't, you don't have to drink alcohol. You can actually just break all the alcohol bottles in your home and stay away from it. And if you see someone drinking, go the other direction. And you'll, you'll find out, you'll find out exactly if you're addicted, um, to, to something, are you going to go through that withdrawal? Yeah. yeah. I found that with everything that I was previously addicted to, whether it be cigarettes or alcohol is I just didn't want to say no. It, it takes an immense amount of pride. That's why the indulging in sin darkens your intellect and pride sort of takes over, hardens your heart. 
is that you you just refuse to acknowledge the elephant in the room, and that is the conscious choice to sin. That's yeah. it. Well, there there's a gully that you have to go through when you let go of a sin because or or quote quote unquote addiction, um, because it's going to be dark and cold and lonely first in the absence of that thing that you were using for heat yeah. and for comfort, and when you're not presented with a clear path toward the better thing or just another thing to fill that void they're like well just anything but the void i'll stay here because like i have the thing right now and then there's a place where i don't have anything for a long unknown period of time before i allegedly you're telling me there's something better over there and so it, t it actually takes a massive leap of courage of faith to say, okay, I'm going to go with nothing and the willingness, and this is, I think, part of that ego death I was describing, that willingness for a believer to say, okay, Christ, when you were on the cross and you said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That in that moment, Christ himself, the person of Christ, did not feel consolation. He was in the dark night of the soul. He was not feeling anything from God the Father. He was not getting consolation that what he was doing was correct. And in that moment, he made the full decision to lay down his life almost as an act of faith, though he is God, for everybody, for every every person specifically and individually, he made that decision. It's in that moment that the, that the true decision is made that no matter what, even if there is six months, a year, six years, 10 years, the rest of my life of We'll, we'll say, we'll pick um, loneliness as an example. Because typically, I think when men seek out pornography, they want intimacy because they're alone. And they're like, okay, well, if I stop watching porn, how long till I get a girlfriend? How long till I get a wife? You're telling me that I can't do this, but I might be alone for the next five years. You know, imagine, imagine a 16, 17-year-old guy or a 20-year-old guy or a 25-year-old guy. You're telling them you have to go an undetermined, period of years alone without this comfort here first it's like well in the moment the, let's say you're a believer in the moment that your savior died for you he died not knowing not having that consolation it was a leap of faith for him as well and he did it specifically for you so take that leap of faith into the into the darkness into the unknown and do it for your savior unite with his suffering on the cross you know that go Tim you're you're a soup sorry sorry I just the way we're we're riffing a lot today and and uh your outline is amazing well but I just want to say Nick's assuming here that this is a difficulty as it should be that's unique to young unmarried men well if I'm not going to use pornea as an aid or a crutch then it, it's an untold amount of time how long I have to be celibate against my will if I'm going to do the right thing and rescue myself from spiritual and political enslavement it's it's a shame some of the numbers will was throwing at us in the chat that married men are almost in the same situation they don't know how long well if i don't have my my prawn i don't know how long it'll be until i go and and i have sex and this isn't speaking of sensitive touchy issues mike where you you tell someone oh that's not a real addiction and it's like an addiction it's a good analogy but it's not they get mad Guys get really mad when you suggest, like, Will there or myself in public ways, like on Twitter. You know, you should be having a lot of sex with your wife if you're married. You should have zero sex before you're married. And you should have much sex after you're married. We don't take a vow of celibacy. It's not part of this vocation. And all you'll get hit with is... um law by exception and people will be like what if you know, i'm married to a quadriplegic and she has no arms <laughs> like, okay. this is unique that's unique i'm not saying that somebody whose wife is in a coma should should they shouldn't be sexually active then don't don't ascribe that to me will didn't say that either we're saying most people's wives aren't quadriplegic coma <laughs> patients and therefore they should be having sex and we know why you're throwing the quadriplegic coma fact pattern hypothetical at me it's because of feminism in your marriage and your marriage and your marriage and what these guys do is they dress it up in the moral garb of oh, yeah. holiness well maybe they're just walking together toward 
a holier marriage. Now, <laughs> that 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 begins through not pretending we've taken the vow of celibacy. Most guys that are married and are like, well, if I don't have prawn, I don't know how long it'll be till I have sex. It could be months. That's a problem. And um, there's there's a certain subset of anon Twitter Catholic jerks, Spurgs, who regularly will throw around Will's name or my name just because like these guys, these guys are gay. They like, <laughs> they think you should have sex with your wife. That's so gay. I'm just sick of it, man. Sorry, this is this is a very big screen, but it is true. <laughs> it's it's really profound point theologically as well because the misconception is so deep. The um, one of the purposes of the marital act is remedy for concupiscence, and it's actually the means by which grace is induced in the souls of the spouses. So you're actually losing out on that by pretending that celibacy and marriage are somehow compatible. So they're doing damage to their spiritual state and that of their spouse by not granting the marital debt when it's requested. And there are wives out there in the way Tim is describing a few husbands, probably two, or not as many, maybe sadly it's more common now who are denying the spouse and then increasing the likelihood that porn is going to come into the marriage and infect it. It's really dangerous. And there seems to be a level of arrogance about the spiritual life where people think they can skip to like sainthood while on earth. And let's say it's porn addiction or lust or something. They're like, well, I'll just not have it. Excuse me? Like, since when did you cultivate that virtue? What what 50-year stint did you put in at the monastery to be able to operate in this way? Like, how about you start by putting things in place that remove the the near occasions of sin? How about you, you and your wife both lose 25 pounds, so you're more attractive to each other, and you're having sex three times a week. Did you did you try that? Like, there's um, Rat Park is a, a interesting study that was done where they um, put heroin or cocaine, I can't remember, but some euphoria in the water of mice. And it was, you know, just normal mouse cage. And the mice would activate it to drink water. And they found that, of course, the, the mice got addicted and many of them overdosed and, um, and or would just be like just hitting it as much as, humanly possible or mice mousily possible um and then they Why expand that oh because they then expanded oh, the okay. um cage put a many many more rats in there gave them all of rat toys that rats need you know like shapes and wheels and ladders and tubes and stuff like that they gave them a very fulfilling rat environment and they used the drug but they never got addicted to the drug and they never overdosed on the drug. And if somebody is just removing a drug from their life, like pornography or even just lust of the eyes, it really helps if your life gets more fulfilling. And at, in, in interrogating your life and thinking, well, why... As a married guy with two kids, why am I watching porn? Or as even as a single guy... You're, you're a single guy. You can do anything you want in this world as a single guy. Anything you want for almost no money. Why aren't, why aren't you in Europe right now? Go to Europe. Go to Bali. When I was 19, I went to Bali. Why? Because I was curious. Just go do stuff. Live a more interesting life. And sitting behind your laptop looking like a monkey is not, you know, going to be as appealing to you then. So yep. go get a rat park. Make your life a rat park. That's the Orpheus point, Nick. You, you got to have good things to focus on as well as removing the temptations as well. And Ecclesiasticus 33, 29 has got some great wisdom on this. Idleness hath taught much evil. It's basically the point you just made. Idleness mm. hath taught much evil. Get busy. And the reason for that is that, I love this too, Mark 14, 38, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the flesh there just refers to the reality of concupiscent man. We're prone to disorder, especially 
in the areas of sex and also food because one is about the preservation of the species and the other is about the preservation of our individual lives. So those are two really powerful drives. Tim mentioned the connection between the two earlier on, but we have to guard against that in particular. And I think that's the true red pill, the true red pill in terms of your eyes opening to the reality of human nature is that the flesh is weak. So there's a, an irony in the, that's the way in which guys have been most enslaved now because they've been convinced it's, it's natural. And they should behave like monkeys in trousers, which is just like a satanic joke, isn't it? So with all the commandment episodes, they always end up being far richer than I imagined they were going to be. It turns out the Ten Commandments are actually really important, guys. Who'd have thought it? <laughs> <laughs> Someone should write them down on a very hard to break yeah. object and put them somewhere. <laughs> they were in a book somewhere. That's what I remember. <laughs> well... Pleasure speaking with you as always, and I uh, look forward to next week's show. Thanks everybody for joining.